morning. Well, on Tuesday of this past week, I did what I often do as I'm heading off to work. I stop at my refrigerator and I open it up and I take a Diet Coke out. And this is my refrigerator. And uh, of course, if you look a little closer at the refrigerator, you would see that there's a lot of fingerprints on it that need to kind of be touched up. Uh, If you opened up the refrigerator, you will find uh, outdated salad dressings and probably carrots that aren't too crunchy anymore. But overall, the refrigerator looks pretty good, right? I mean, it, it does its job. Went off to work, and then a little bit later in the afternoon, I was uh, coming home before I had to go back to the church for a meeting, and uh, Mark called me, and he said, Marty, there's this weird sound in our kitchen, and I could hear the weird sound in the kitchen. So I got there, and the first thing I thought was, oh my goodness, the, the fan in the refrigerator is out. So we looked really silly, I'm sure. We got on the the ground and we uh, took stuff out. We vacuumed the the little in there to see if something was busted in the the bottom of the refrigerator as if we would have known, right? But it it didn't seem like that was the problem. So I turned off the refrigerator, the power, and you could still hear the sound. That you could hear it better. And I realized that it was water. So we pull the refrigerator out, and back behind the refrigerator, there's this little blue tube that goes from our water source downstairs to our ice maker upstairs, and there was this little tiny hole that was spewing all kinds of water out. It took us a while to figure out how to turn the water off, where to find the valve. We found that eventually, and then I went downstairs like, It was spewing water for hours, so that water had to go somewhere. Went downstairs, looked up at the sheetrock, and things looked pretty good. Then I got on a ladder, and I put my hand back uh, in where the duct work is, above the jam, going into our storage area, and there was a ton of water. Took screws and uh, put holes in the sheetrock and flood, water, 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 and more water. You know, my refrigerator looked great. My ceiling looked fine. But there was damage and drama going on that I couldn't see. And even once I, I, I found the leak, there was more drama going on. Today we're beginning our series called The Good Fight. There is a battle going on that you cannot see with your eyes, but it's there. C.S. Lewis says that we live in a world where every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. There is a force in this world that not only does not want your good, there's a force that wants to tear you down and wants to separate you very far from God. There's a force that wants to ruin you. There's a force that would love for you to stop coming to church. There's a force that would love for COVID to continue to separate us and keep us isolated. There's a force in the world that would love your marriage to break up. There's a force in this world that would love you to be so caught up in yourself and so busy that you stop investing in your family and your friends and your city. See, there is so much more going on in our world than meets the eye. All around us, there's this unseen spiritual world where untold legions of spiritual forces are doing spiritual battle. Paul uses a military metaphor because it's serious and the stakes are eternal. Over the next few weeks, we're going to learn from Paul how we can fight the good fight, how we can live victorious as believers. How we cannot get ripped apart. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. As we begin the series, we have to start by defining reality for every single human being. There is a battle for your soul. The battle is real. In fact, if you open up the Bible, this battle starts from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And then in the Old Testament, the battle is there. And then when we get to Jesus, Jesus is tempted by the devil. Jesus does battle with spiritual forces when he does miracles. The spiritual battle is in the letters of Peter, and it's the letters of Paul. And of course, the battle shows up big in the book of Revelation. But you know this, the the spiritual battle doesn't end with the books of Scripture. It's real in my life. And it's real in your life. So we start this series on spiritual warfare. I thought it was really important for us to think about what does that mean? What is spiritual warfare? And there's a really good definition by a guy named Thomas B. White. Here it is. He says, spiritual warfare is a multi-level conflict between good and evil. Initiated on the supernatural plane with the prehistoric rebellion of Lucifer. Now, as an aside, that is talking about an angel. There was an angel named Lucifer. And he rebelled against God and wanted to be God. And he was banished from God because of his rebellion. White says, but that conflict is transferred over onto the natural plane with the fall of humans. Satan, our adversary, continues to deceive and divert people from finding salvation in Jesus Christ and continues to harass and hinder Christians through enticement to sin and exploitation of weakness. Warfare implies the likelihood of losses, eternal separation from God for the non-believer, and diminished effectiveness and suffering for the believer. Now, it's not unusual for Christians to ignore this battle. And to think, this battle doesn't really have anything to do with me. But let me make it a little more personal for you. Every time you're presented with the opportunity to say something nasty and vindictive behind someone's back, you're on the battlefield. Every time you're tempted to go back to a destructive habit in your life, you're on the battlefield. Every time you're tempted to cheat or to consider not forgiving someone, you've stepped onto the battlefield. Every chance you have an opportunity to lie your way to the top at work or blame your colleague for something you did, you're on the battlefield. Every time you find yourself wondering what it would be like to be with someone else's spouse, you're on the battlefield. Every time you make a choice between love and hate, between blessing or cursing, you're on the battlefield. As a follower of Jesus, you are not living your life on a playground. You are living your life on a battlefield. Once you took a breath, you entered into this world. And and this world, there is a force which actively wants you to be separated from God. And once you say yes to Jesus, you become his enemy. And once you continue to say yes to Jesus, you get a promotion to the front line of the battle. 
See, Paul is very clear who our battle is against. Verse 12, we just read it. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Friends, the devil is not a cartoon character that wears a red outfit and has a pitchfork. He is a force that is at work. Satan is identified actually 32 times in the New Testament. And he has all kinds of names. Here are some of them. Adversary. Liar. Tempter. Destroyer. Murderer. Jesus talks about him, and Paul talks about him, and Peter talks about him. In fact, here's what Peter says. He says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Paul says we wrestle against Satan and against spiritual forces. Now, our son John was a wrestler in high school, and and I grew to respect a lot this sport that feels a lot like me to, to physical chess. But when I go to wrestling at Lehigh and watch Pat Santoro coach, I have a totally different view. See, Paul says we wrestle. And watching those Lehigh wrestlers, man, it it is so intense. It is so close. It is so personal. It is so in your face. See, Paul would have known wrestling. You would be familiar with that. Wrestling goes back all the way to then. And Paul knew that we were in this kind of battle, this physical battle. He knows that it's intense. He knows that it's close. He knows that it's real. It is really sobering to know that we have an enemy. But I am so grateful before the Lord That God does not leave you and he doesn't leave me on our own to take on this powerful enemy. See, Jesus came and when he came, he took power over Satan when he died on the cross and when he was resurrected. He won then and he will win ultimately. But for now, Satan still is doing his work. But we have Jesus beside us in the battle. See, Paul tells us what we should do with this battle. He tells us how to fight the good fight. He says, be strong in the Lord's power. What Paul's saying is, there is no way that I can and there's no way that you can fight this battle on our own. We can't do it. He says, be strong in the Lord. I love how God tells Joshua in the book of Joshua in Joshua 1.9. He's right in the middle of the battle. And he says, be bold, Joshua. Be strong. And here's why. I'm with you. The Lord, your God, is with you. Paul says, be strong. And if you're a grammar person, in Greek, that's passive tense. Which means It should really be translated, be strengthened from the outside. You you can't strengthen yourself. Only God can strengthen you for this battle. Be strong in the Lord. Only he can give you the life that you were made for. And only he can give you the, the victory in your life. Paul knew this. One of my favorite verses. Y'all say this one with me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
I love that verse, but too many of us say, I can do all things, period. That's not what the verse says, right? It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. It's in you. And Paul says, the way you're going to access that power is to put on the armor. Now, no matter what you think about these things, and I can't wait till we're not wearing them anymore, but there are cloth masks, there are N95 masks, there are KN95 masks. And it's pretty remarkable that in just a very short amount of time, every single person in the world is wearing one of these. And they're wearing it because there's this thought that this is going to help us face and defeat COVID. Now, COVID has nothing on Satan. Right? So when you're putting this on this week, I want you to remember this verse. See, there is a threat, and Paul says the way to deal with the threat is to put on the armor of God. Now, maybe today you're going, well, my life's pretty easy. I don't think that I'm in a battle. Paul's saying, don't wait. Don't wait for the battle. Go ahead and put on the armor of God. The armor of God is this gift that we have from God. It's his strength. And when we put on the armor of God, we are connected to that strength. There are really two parts of the armor. First, the armor really is our identity as believers. It's, It's a gift from God. It reminds us who we are. But the armor is also action. There's an action connected with each piece of the armor. So there's this chart that we're going to walk through, and and I'm going to send this to you later on the week because it's hard to take it all in, but but I want you to see what, what I'm trying to say. Put on the belt of truth. Now, your position in Christ is that Jesus is your truth. But then there's an action, a, a practice for you. We have to walk in truth as people of integrity. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Of course, Jesus is our righteousness. When we put on that, it's Jesus. But our action is we're to live righteously. We're to move away from sin. Put on the the gospel of peace, the shoes of the gospel of peace. Of course, Jesus is the good news. He's the one who restores us to peace. We're to proclaim the gospel. Hold that shield of faith. Of course, Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. But we're to trust. We're to have faith. We're to believe the promises of God are true. Put on the helmet of salvation. Of course, Jesus is our salvation. But we're to live out our salvation as children of God and allow it to affect our our thinking and our actions. And then last, hold on to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Of course, Jesus is the Word of God. But we're to know the Word. We're to, to live the Word. We're to proclaim the Word. Now, maybe you look at that list, and we're going to be going through that over the next few weeks. And you go, I like that one, and I like that one, and I like that one. But Paul says you can't pick which parts of the armor you're going to have. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. See, what Paul knows is that Satan will attack us in all kinds of ways. So sometimes he'll attack your emotions. Other times he'll attack your mind. Other times you'll, you'll have doubts 
Other times you'll, you'll be confused. So you need the whole armor. I mean, can you imagine a football player saying, well, hey, I'll wear a helmet, but I'm just not doing shoulder pads. Or I'm going uh, I'm, I'm to wear guards on my arms, but I just don't feel like wearing shoes. No, you, you need the whole armor of God because Satan attacks in different ways. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God so you can stand firm. Now, I got to say, as I've been studying this week, <laughs> I really wish Paul had said, put on the whole armor of God so you can knock the devil out. Put on the whole armor of God so you can end any impact he's going to have in your life. Put on the whole armor of God, and that's going to kill Satan. That's not what Paul says. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God so you can stand firm. Now, at first glance, stand sounds kind of passive. But standing is not passive, it's a position. Paul's saying, stand firm. Hold your position. Hold your ground. See, Paul knows this side of heaven, the battle is not going away. And Paul knows I'm weak. And Paul knows you're weak. And Paul knows he's weak. But he knows that Jesus is strong. And he knows that Jesus is the winner. But until Jesus comes back, Satan is still roaming the world. Satan is still leading the charge to tear you down and to rip you away from the Lord and away from the purposes he has in your life for you. So let me say that one more time because we don't talk enough about this. There will be a day when Jesus comes back and that will be the end of Satan in the world. There will be no more tears. There will be no more tempting. There will be no more threats. But we live in the in-between times as we await his return. Paul is telling us the enemy is serious. And the battle is real. But Jesus is bigger and he has this armor for you to help you live victory over it all. A few months ago, we were walking through Nehemiah, and when we were talking about Nehemiah's spiritual battles, I gave you this metaphor. Here it is. In the 1990s, the Jurassic Park movie series was born, and of course, what they did in that series was they brought prehistoric dinosaurs to life through science. Phenomenal stories, intense cinematography, very popular movies. But there was one really hallmark of that series, and that was when the dinosaurs fought. And there was one specific fight sequence that came came up over and over again in these movies. Now, I'm going to try to keep it simple because I don't really know the names of the dinosaurs. So here we go. The medium-sized dinosaur <laughs> is going after the small dinosaur. And it's not going very well for the small dinosaur. But just as the medium dinosaur is about to take out the small dinosaur, a big dinosaur sweeps in and takes out the medium-sized dinosaur. And the small dinosaur is safe. Keep that image in your mind and hear how John talks about you as a follower of Jesus. 
He says, you dear children, you're from God. And you've overcome them. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about how we get ready for the battle. How we fight the good fight. Because Jesus himself has given us this armor. May it be so. Let's pray. God, by your Holy Spirit, would you empower us to fight the good fight, to live our lives equipped in your power, in your strength, standing firm against the evil one and anything that would keep us from you. God, open our our eyes and our hearts as we study this important passage of Scripture. Keep showing us what it means to put on the full armor of God and to fight the good fight. We pray it in the name of your Son, our Savior, the one who walks with us in the battle and the one who sends us out in the world in power. 